We're excited to invite everyone into this brand new series that sort of sheds some light on the topic international expansion and growth. Uh, and we're very, very fortunate to have an exceptional business leader in Troy Malone joining us today to share a bit about his story in helping Evernote expand into the Indian market. And before I start to kind of share a bit of, I guess, additional information on Global Class and what we're doing at the company, let me bring Aaron in to do a short introduction of himself as well. Sure. Uh, thanks, Klaus. So uh, Klaus and I are uh, co-founders of 10X Innovation Lab, where we help uh, both corporates and, and uh, companies. Uh, corporate side is uh, helping them with uh, their innovation uh, processes and, um, and mindset and, and implementing that in their companies and, and in terms of uh, startups helping uh, build entrepreneurial ecosystems across the world and, and helping a number of, of uh, clients that are often government agencies across the world and, and helping their companies validate the Silicon Valley market. And uh, outside of that, I, I teach at UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business and have been a serial entrepreneur myself. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Um, before we get Troy into the conversation a bit later here, I want to share a bit more information on, on Global Class and what we've been doing over the past one and a half year, actually, because we have done a lot of extensive work and research on the topic of international growth and expansion. In fact, so much so that we have had over 400 conversations with different business leaders on this very topic to kind of figure out you know, what it takes to build truly a global organization and take a company from their initial market to global markets. And so um, Aaron and myself, we have had many hours of research, obviously. And one of those is actually Troy Malone, who is our uh, guest of today. Uh, but again, before uh, welcoming him into the session, I want to share just a couple of thoughts here. So before, uh, before, uh, before we, we have this conversation, just today, we're going to have uh, the way that the format and program is, is going to be run is that we're going to have about 15 minute live presentation on, you know, Troy sharing his story of expanding Evernote into India. Then afterwards, we're going to have a really, really exciting conversation around localization and complexity. And, and here we'll, we'll use a tool that we've developed in, in our book, Global Class, that's coming out in August. And then afterwards, we're going to open up to the floor to have a bit of Q&A and live conversation. If you have any questions uh, about today's topic and of Troy's presentation on his expansion story. And so we want to welcome a dialogue and conversation at the end of today's call. And so why Global Class and why the book that Aaron and myself uh, have been writing and are coming out with in August, in fact, the third week of August, is that, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, Aaron and I, we were thinking about writing a book because, you know, things slowed a bit down. So we had a lot more time on our hands. And so in the beginning, we weren't quite sure, sure what topic to focus on, but quickly discovered that the topic international expansion and growth wasn't well covered. And so we found that to be super interesting. And so we decided to delve a lot deeper. And we did actually find that there was no lean startup or no, uh, no good to great or no zero to one book, uh, book on this topic. And so we were very, very excited to dive into amazing conversation with Troy and others to really build this book that really shares uh, the narrative on how to build a global organization. And so what are we trying to do, uh, Aaron and myself? We're trying to do, you know, similar to what Eric Ries has done with Agile. You know, Agile, as you know, you know, were happening around in different pockets, you know, back in the day. But really what Eric Ries did was to bring it together in building a common vocabulary and, and framework and mindset around Agile. And he was really, really good at socializing that to, to bring wider adoption to this very methodology. And so Aaron and myself were, were doing the very same thing around global expansion and growth. And so again, we've had a lot of conversations and gotten insights from business leaders from really the fastest growing companies in the world, everything from uh, Slack to Canva to LinkedIn, the head of international from, from Apple to the head of international for Zoom, uh, to also the managing director of Talibat Kuwait uh, and so forth. So really going out there in the world to really learn from these business exec executives and distilling these insights into practical and actionable you know, concepts, frameworks, uh, and tools to help you on your growth journey. And so one of the big things that we found was the companies often reinvent the wheel. 
And even, you know, uh, executives that were now in an operational role of fast growing tech companies, but were previously at big consulting firms, they said to us that they had, they didn't have any frameworks to call back on. And, it, and also an additional insight that we learned was that international expansion was often a solitary experience. And so Aaron and myself and global class and the organization overall is on a mission to make global growth and expansion a, a, a shared experience. Hence the framework, uh, hence the books, hence uh, this webinar, and hence also the podcast that we've launched as well. And so I want to stop there and actually let Aaron take over and do a bit of introduction to Troy before we delve into his, his presentation of today. Awesome. Thanks, Klaus. So we are super excited to have you here, Troy. Troy has been a, a great supporter of Global Class and, and everything that been working on with with uh, what Klaus was going through. And and uh, one of the things we talk about in the book is this notion of an entrepreneur, which is somebody who has this cultural mindset that, that understands and has empathy for other cultures and, and other markets. And, and that really you know helps them build a business that, that works and localizes for that market. And I, and I think Klaus would also agree that, that you know, Troy is really the definition of an entrepreneur and, and one of the archetypes where uh, we've been thinking about it. So um, excited to to um, to introduce him and and you'll you'll hear when he starts talking. He has some great stories uh, and, and they come from this great career experience. So in the past, he was uh, vice president at Blue Sky Broadcasting and an enterprise learning management system. He was also CEO and president of. Pelotonics, which has nothing to do with Peloton bikes, right? Uh, project management solution. Um, and then he moved on to, to be at Evernote where he was GM of international. So headed up that effort where he was responsible for 90 million of their users and almost half of revenue, which, um, which is where the, the story of, of India is gonna come in uh, that, that Troy's gonna explain. After that, he went on to, um, to have a similar role of international operations at executive level at Weebly. And, and that was one of the big reasons why they were um, acquired by Square because of the work he did to, to build this global organization. And then most recently, he's been working as part of All Turtles, which is a product studio uh, that that um, was founded by Phil Libin, who was also a founder, uh, one of the founders of, of Evernote. And so they're working together again. And, and one of the main products that Troy has been working on of late is mm -hmm, which is this awesome video platform that really enhances platforms like uh, like Zoom and, and others that, that we're living on nowadays, given the pandemic. So uh, he's also a, a graduate twice of, of BYU, one uh, an MBA, and prior to that has a BA in Korean language, which I, I think will fit into some of his entrepreneur mindset we talked about. But with that, uh, love to, to introduce you, uh, Troy. So welcome, Troy. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Um... I, I think you're still on mute. Oh, am I? Or, or uh, I'm You're not good. Hearing. You're good. I'm good. Okay. okay. I thought I took myself off mute. Isn't Zoom fun? Uh, but thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you to both of you for the work that you've been doing in this space. This is when you say that international expansion is typically a, a very isolated endeavor. <laughs> and I, I think that a lot of executives that do it would would agree with that characterization because it's uh, uh, taking an existing organization into new markets is kind of like going from what you know and you've figured out as an organization to need to go and figure it out again in new markets. And, and sometimes that's not the easiest journey and uh, can, can feel like you're kind of isolated. So uh, thanks for all the work that you're doing. I've really, I've got, you know, kind of a, a little bit of preview of concepts from the book and I absolutely love it. I've been using them in, in my work. So I think that everyone's going to be really excited to get their hands on this book and get, uh, these frameworks that they can work with to kind of present, um, international expansion and, and the why and getting, getting the resource you need to be able to do it. So I think this book is, is, well-placed, it's needed, and I'm happy that it's coming out. Um, so I guess what I'll do is uh, give a, a short presentation on uh, uh, some of my experiences in India. I'll hone in on a couple of uh, specific um, topics that hopefully are interest of interest to you, and then I'll uh, 
you know, join back in with uh, Aaron and, and talk through some, some things uh, that hopefully will also be interesting to you about rating India on a few dimensions for international expansion. So uh, he mentioned that I work for a company called All Turtles, as he said, the product studio that built the, 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 uh, the tool that I'm gonna be using today to present this, which is called mm -hmm, MMHMM. And it essentially allows you to uh, present slides and different things uh, like so. Uh, so I'll be going through kind of a few pictures, kind of a few, um, few things to help illustrate some of my points. But I wanted to start with my experience in India. When I first started going to India, um, I didn't know much about the culture. I didn't know much about the business environment. All I knew at the time was that I had had a team in India, a small team in India, my prior company that I managed out of uh, Gurgaon, uh, India, and uh, I, they were an outsourced dev shop for me, and that was about it. That was my extent of the knowledge of the Indian marketplace. So I had to learn a lot. And really the way that I like to learn is obviously doing a lot of background research um, from afar, but then really getting on the ground and getting to know people, getting to talk with people directly so that I can ask questions and uh, record observations that I see about the target market that I'm going after in, in India. So going over there, speaking at events, uh, talking with a lot of people directly is, is definitely something that I focused on and was able to learn a lot as a result by doing this. So I've had a lot of great experiences all throughout India. And uh, frankly, you know, I, I, I learned a ton about the Indian marketplace and ended up taking it from, uh, in Evernote's case, I took it from, uh, when I started, we had 20,000 users in India when I started, uh, which, for Evernote was pretty much nothing. Uh, we, we had many millions of users in other countries, but we didn't have any traction in India really. But within two years, we got it to, to 2 million users in India and got it up to four or five beyond, you know, a few years beyond that. Uh, so saw a lot of growth in India. And I'm going to talk about two things that, um, that I did, two experiences that I had, on one on the marketing front and the other one's on the payments front that I hope are, are of interest to you. Uh, if you're thinking about India or, um, you know, I have always wondered what it's like to do business in the Indian marketplace, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, share these experiences with you and, and feel free to get your questions ready for the end so that we can kind of cover some of those. But marketing uh, in India was... Uh, you know, it's an English speaking country for the most part. Uh, obviously, Hindi is, is really, I would say, the day to day language, but the target demographic that I was going after was definitely English speaking. So it's easy to kind of say, well, if they're English speaking, then, you know, the typical marketing methods would, would be the order of the day. Uh, right? Doing Google ads, doing YouTube ads, things like that. But it turns out that at the time, India was almost a mobile first country. So there wasn't, uh, the way that they consumed media and, and everything was, was very different than the experience that we were having uh, you know, in the US or, or the UK even. Uh, it, was, it was really a different experience. So I wanted to cater to the authentic kind of Indian experience. And one day, I was in India, in Mumbai, actually, and I saw a guy with a bunch of things on his head like this. And I asked my country manager, his name was Anirban Mukopadhyay. I'm so happy that I can pronounce it. It took me like a year before I could pronounce his last name correctly. That's why I love saying it. Anirban Mukopadhyay. So I asked Anirban, what is this? Like, what is this guy doing? What are these things on his head? And it turns out that these things on his head are lunches that typically the, the you know, if it was a working person at a, 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 a day job, like, like, like a, uh, a professional who goes to an office, 
either their wife or if, if it was, you know, someone's daughter who was working, say, at PwC or some big company in a big office building, the mom or, or, or someone would make a lunch for them and put it into these tins. And then there's this whole system, they're called Daba Valas, that deliver it uh, to everyone at their desk. And an interesting thing about Dababala, as I looked into it, is Harvard has actually done a big study on them and done like a Six Sigma study on them because the logistical challenges that they face at getting all of these particular things to everyone's desk correctly in a city of tens of millions of people is pretty impressive. And so Harvard did a big study on how Six Sigma, they're, they're using elements of Six Sigma and and people have really studied this in business school. So I thought that was really cool. And then I thought to myself, I said, well, if there's all these business people, and I'll go back to this picture here, that, that are getting these tins at their desk during lunchtime, is there a way that I could kind of put an advertisement in there? Because I was launching Evernote Business. And I thought, what a cool thing to do to be, you know, yeah, you can see a YouTube advertisement, you can see something online, which would be kind of what a typical Silicon Valley company would do. And of course, we did do that. But I said, I want to get something that's a little more uh, homegrown, like something that people would be a little bit delighted to see and kind of surprised and actually have a lot of curiosity when they see the Evernote logo in there with a little thing talking about Evernote business. And it ended up, so I figured out how to do it. Actually, I say, I, it's all about the team, right? So Anderban figured out how to do this. And we put an insert into all these tins all throughout Mumbai, which is really the financial center of, uh, of India. And we got tremendous response for Evernote business specifically with these professionals who wanted to be using Evernote together on the job to collect information, manage information, et cetera, for their businesses. So that was actually a big success and something that I never would have found on the internet. I never would have found unless I was on the ground watching this happen right before me and asking questions and trying to figure out what we could do with it. So I think that was kind of an interesting, hyper-localized marketing effort that luckily ended up being very successful. And uh, I always try to find opportunities like this that will make a Silicon Valley company stand out and feel different than all the rest. You're never going to see Google do this or Facebook or any of the others. So this was something that became a little bit of a competitive advantage in the very crowded marketplace that we were in. Next, I want to talk about a little story about payments. Now, payments in India was always a head scratcher for me. It was a problem. I was always scratching my head saying, how, how am I going to solve for allowing people in India to be able to pay for Evernote in a convenient way. And when I first went to India in, I think it was like 2012 or so, when I first went to India studying the marketplace and really India was a cash-based economy. Everything was cash and that was just the way it was. But I, I in my research in going to India, I did notice that in the demographic of people that could pay for Evernote, most of those people seemed to, at least from my internet research, they seemed to all have credit cards. So the issuance of credit cards was pretty high and, and the penetration was pretty high in the demographic that I was focused on, which initially I got pretty excited and said, well, great, so I don't have to worry about it. All I need to do is get uh, you know, a, a local credit card processor and, and be able to do credit card payments in India. I looked into it further though, and I learned something. I learned about the Indian ante. <laughs> I didn't know this is actually on Indian Netflix. They have this, this special called Indian antes, but Indian antes are essentially 
people that are related to you. So let's say you're a young professional. You have a few aunties in your family that are always asking you, uh, when are you going to get married? And if you are married, they're always asking you, when are you going to have kids? And it's a, it's a standing joke in India that the aunties are always in your business. They're always trying to tell you how to live your life, right? And I think there's many other cultures where this is also the case. But the Indian auntie is something that I learned about. And what I learned with regard to payments is that yes, all of these young professionals had credit cards, but nobody was using them. And I asked, I said, why is it, why is credit card penetration so high, but nobody is using their credit cards? And I remember I was actually in the back of a rickshaw with uh, Honorban, and I was asking him, why is this the case? I don't get it. The data is telling me something and it doesn't, I don't see the, the proof on the ground that people are using credit cards. And he said, well, Troy, everyone has an ante in their life that has told them a scary story about a relative who has gotten into debt using credit cards and gotten into trouble and had a hard time because they got into so much debt with credit cards. So everyone's auntie tells them not to use credit cards. So this was a very cultural thing that you couldn't find from the data, but you could find from asking questions on the ground, right? So then something, so I waited and I said, okay, everyone has credit cards, but nobody's using them. So I actually waited until uh, maybe a couple years later, something happened. And some of you may remember this. In India, they outlawed or retired um, uh, the, the lower de denominations of cash. So it's the equivalent of saying, we're not going to allow for $10 bills or $20 bills. They took them out of the economy. And at a certain date, nobody could use them for legal tender. And they did this to try to ward off corruption. But what this did, to my advantage, is because they took all this cash out of the economy, people had to find alternative ways of doing transactions. And around this same time, a company called Paytm came about. It started and it, it when the cash thing happened, it became huge. So the way I judge if an app is ubiquitous and if everyone is using it is I don't ask the venture capitalists because they're gonna use things first or wealthy young professionals they're going to be early adopters and use that kind of app first. I ask taxi drivers and people that are serving me at a restaurant. I ask them if they use Paytm. And it got to the point after the cash was taken out of the economy that all taxi drivers, all people that were working at a restaurant were all telling me that they were using Paytm. So I now knew that Paytm was everywhere. And oh, by the way, in order to use Paytm, you had to use your credit card as the, as the source of funds. So now everyone was using their credit cards because now it was kind of like using cash. So this, this whole phenomenon changed and then we were able to capitalize on that. And, and I put payment processes in place and we were able to, to very successfully start receiving payments for Evernote Premium and Evernote Business through credit cards. And that really changed our business from a revenue perspective in India. So those two experiences I hope are helpful to you because I wanna share some experiences where sometimes we do a lot of research about a particular market online but when we get into the market and we hire people in that market, we start to get more of a full picture and you can start to do some clever things to be a little more local in those marketplaces. So those are the two examples that I wanted to give as, as kind of an upfront presentation here. And uh, I hope that that was helpful. And now I wanna, I guess, uh, Aaron, 
over to you to uh, yep. talk through the and, yeah the, the, and, the great and framework. Thing, <laughs> sure, and, and one thing just to confirm about uh, about your guys' growth story in, in India. So when when you found that there were these auntie stories, did that keep you from prioritizing the market until this change happened, or were these was this government change with the lower denomination currency happening at the same time? Just, just to clarify. Yeah, that no, that's a great question. Um, I always sequence my markets. Yeah. So um, India was in a, I had two buckets of countries back then yeah. as I was working for Evernote. One country was fully ready to monetize. Yeah. So those were European countries. Those were uh, even some in South America were, were uh, ready to monetize. Not all countries in South America, but there were some that, that were ready to monetize. So those I was actively seeking out, um, you know, ways to pay, et cetera. But for the other basket of countries in which India was, those were countries where I was less concerned about monetization and transactions and more concerned about just user growth because we were so nascent to begin with in yeah. that country. I wanted to get the user base up to more of a critical mass and then start monetizing. So it was during this time that I was focusing on just user growth that I was watching these payment things happen so that when I was ready to monetize, luckily it all lined up, you know, timing doesn't always work out, but luckily the timing worked out that when we were ready to start monetizing, all of these things had happened. So I knew what to do. There was no question, right? So yeah, that's kind of how it happened for us in India and a few other countries, but India was very... India was one of the few countries where there was that uh, dynamic of a change that I didn't see coming. And I read about it in the news and I said, ooh, how is this going to impact us? And it ended up being a very good catalyst to being able to monetize. Well, that's awesome, awesome context. So what we want to do now is, is dig in a little bit more into some of the specifics of, of the India expansion. And what we wanted to do is use one of the frameworks that, that Klaus and I have built as part of Global Class in order to do that. And, uh, and so, you know, what, one of the things that we often heard is how, uh, when it comes to these localizations that you're, you're, you've been touching on, Troy, about how difficult it can be. Um, you know, one, we found a lot of companies uh, maybe that first global market they go into, they're very mindful about all of these localizations and things that happen. But then when you get into market three, four, five, six, ten, 10, it kind of becomes an afterthought. And, and a lot of companies have, have expressed to us that they created a lot of problems for themselves that they then had to go back and fix. Uh, the other challenge was, was how, depending on who you talk to in the organization, they have a very myopic view of things. And, and a lot of companies don't necessarily have that role that Troy played of being the head of, of international expansion. And so, uh, you know, if you talk to whoever's in sales, they think, well, what country, you know, they, they have their own buckets to the, the analogy that, that Troy had just used. Um, so, so basically... Um, you know, they, they're, you're going to get a bunch of different perspectives because things aren't being looked at holistically. And then the third part is, is communicating this. So uh, it, it might be hard for Troy to say, okay, I learned all of this about India. Well, how do I describe to, to Phil Libin and the rest of the executive team what actually has to be done so we can actually implement things? And so to combat this, uh, we, we basically, uh, Klaus and I created this, uh, this tool we call the localization premium tool. And, and essentially what this tool does is it allows you to get a more holistic view of um, the localizations that are needed. And, and just to translate it real quick, the middle is product market fit in your initial market. So in this case for Evernote, it would be the model that they use from a go-to-market perspective and an operational perspective in the United States. But then they have to deviate from that in order to get fit in India and other countries. And so this tool can help with selecting or prioritizing different, different markets, basically a bridge between that localization discovery that, that uh, Troy was talking about, he was doing and talking to taxi drivers and other stakeholders in India. And then ultimately, how do you create that plan and implement that plan to actually, uh, to actually do the localization and, and launch or, or focus more on the market? And so it can help prioritize, it can help you uh, plan accordingly and, and figure out what information you need to gather. It can kind of give you this holistic look so that you're not forgetting about key aspects 
of your go-to-market or operational strategy so that you're not forgetting things. And, and one thing Klaus and I heard from a number of stories is when you get close to launch, you might forget some major things that, that cost a lot of time and money to fix and delay launches. Uh, it's also a great communication tool because this is the type of thing that, that Troy could show to Phil and the executive team and say, okay, this is the India localization we need to do. Here's the changes that everybody would need to make across the board. And it's also, if you're already in markets, it's a great way to do a post-mortem and actually analyze different markets and, and changes you've had to make and help you uncover some new uh, common uh, traits that might be scalable to other markets for localizations that can be used elsewhere to create some momentum. So, so that said, what, what uh, we'd like to do actually is, is build this a bit on the fly here. So a live case study of Evernote in India. And so what we'll do is uh, go through these various categories. And as we do that, we'll, we'll give a little context to what each category means. And then Troy will be able to come in and explain, you know, how far away from that core of the US model they had to deviate from in order to get fit and localized for the India market. So let's start at the very top, which uh, the, the top three sets of features are more, uh, or, or elements are more go-to-market related, more, more outward facing. And so the one in the very top at the 12 o'clock of, of the clock, so to speak, is sales premium. So that is differences in pricing or differences in revenue model, differences in customer service, um, differences in channel direct versus indirect. So Troy, I'll have you uh, jump in and talk us through this part of the um, of the local. Yeah, position. yeah, and and I'll just say before I go into sales specifically about the the framework, the value of this framework that I really like is when I was at Evernote, um, I was always I had this love hate relationship with a lot of different departments, whether it be finance, whether it be legal, etc., because I was the guy coming in and saying, "Hey, we're going to do some stuff in India." And of course, legal would be like, oh, no, like, you know, oh, what do we have to do? Like, it's there's a lot to learn. But what this framework does is allows you to really pl plot all the dimensions so that you can communicate really nicely to the different places in a very coherent way. I was kind of doing it for the first time in my career. So I was kind of like figuring it out. But this framework gives a very good kind of pathway to follow to make it clear for everyone in the organization what's required. Because I, I can almost guarantee, at least from, from my experience in the companies I've worked at, when you talk about localization, in 90% of people's minds, if they haven't done any international work, they just think, oh, we're going to translate. You know, we're, we need to translate the app. It's like, well, yes. And then we also need to make sure that we have proper invoicing and financial controls in different countries, right? Like there's the whole thing that most people don't think about. So that's why I love this framework. So with that, I will talk about sales. Sales in India, um, I ranked uh, on this chart as a four. So I think we're going to plot this in real time, right? So the reason I, I rated this as a four is there's a fair amount of localization that needed to happen on the sales front. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we ended up selling through uh, a distributor network initially, and then we ended up bringing it into our own sales team. Um, the, the way of selling in the Indian businesses was really different than the way we were doing it in the U.S. or other countries. Um, it was much more outbound than inbound. Um, so there were a lot of changes that we had to make, uh, to just our team that we were hiring. It was a very different team that we had in India than we had in, in some of the other markets. So I would say that sales definitely was different as well as, uh, you mentioned customer support or customer success. That was also different in India, a little more hands-on high touch. Um, but, uh, once you understand those things, it, it was great. And, and once you, you know, localized for those, it, it ended up being good, but Sales was definitely a heavy lift, I would say. Awesome. Um, so then the next category is product premium. And product premium is when you have to change an element of, of the product or service or features of it in order to best meet uh, the, the needs and requirements uh, of uh, or, or problems that exist to solve in that market. Yeah, and, and I'll preface this by saying there's a strong bias with Phil 
being a product led CEO and just a, a really good product person, his, his uh, overall philosophy on product was that if you build a sufficiently epic enough product that you don't need to localize it. And it's, he's mainly talking about the main functionality of the product. Obviously with Evernote, there were some, for, for instance, uh, tie-ins to uh, social media services. And we had to tie into different social media services in certain different countries. Think about China, for instance, right? So there were, there were, but those were minimal in our, in our mind. And, and generally we thought that our philosophy was that if, if uh, you know, we needed to make extensive changes to the product that it, it, it just wasn't worth it to us because we believed we were building a product for humanity essentially. And if we had localizations for payments and other things that were truly local, we were good. But the functionality of taking notes was generally the same. And a, and a human condition, whether you're in Korea or the United States or Saudi Arabia, it was, you know, kind of the same thing. So that was our philosophy. I know that other people may have different philosophies on that, but for Evernote specifically, that was definitely our, where we leaned. So yeah, we didn't and, do and much I, I at all. One thing, just put a little context, and this has to do with the story that, that we had heard from, from another company in LinkedIn as, as they expanded into India because the mobile network is not uh, as advanced and high speed as it is in other countries, you have to be very mindful of that. And so Good point. Uh, from, yeah. from, from, from my perspective, and, uh, and Troy may disagree or not, but the, um, there, there's a good simplicity to Evernote uh, in, in terms of its graphical interface. And so whereas LinkedIn, in the way they were very graphic heavy, it took forever to load. And so they had to create a new version of their app that was very text-based, but it yeah. seemed like maybe the, the the design and layout of Evernote, you didn't have to do that as much. Is that right? We we didn't. And yeah. not that I'm saying that uh, I wouldn't do it differently. Um, yeah. You know, there's probably some some elements that we that we might have done differently. But I would say all in all, we were still very very successful at acquiring users and 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 continuing to keep users on the system. So I think that we were we were okay, you know, and, and we didn't require a lot of localization. Sure. And, and it also, to, to the point you were making before, it depends on who your target customer bases are. True. Right, in terms of yeah, that's um, definitely right. Cool. So then uh, the, the third element, the last of the go-to-market top portion is the marketing premium. And so this includes differences in use case, differences in value proposition, differences in advertising channel, also differences in competitive landscape. So some countries, there might be local competitors that might already exist or, or fast follows to the market. So how, how did that play out in India? Yeah, um, in India, there were a couple points there. I gave the example of the Dabavalas and like marketing within that hyper-local context. And that was kind of a good change that we made for India that worked really well. Um, there, let's see. I'm trying to think there, there was another point there that I'm forgetting now. Um, there, there were definitely changes to the marketing that we had to do. What, one thing that we did, this is what I was thinking about, is we had to create a, a we had to make Evernote into a lifestyle product, like a, 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 an expensive handbag almost feel. Because in India, paying for an app was, at the time, was almost inconceivable. Nobody did it. But what we did is, and I actually did this specifically. I guess I would put this in the marketing bucket. I came up with a really nice looking pin that you could put on your backpack that was an Evernote logo. And the reason I made that pin is if someone signed up for a year of Evernote premium, we would actually deliver that pin to them so they could put it on their backpack and it became a status symbol. So you weren't just paying for Evernote for the premium features. Of course, that was part of it, but you were paying for Evernote to put that pin on your backpack and kind of show people that you could pay for an app, right? And that was kind of like a status symbol and was pretty successful. And we only did that in, in like, Indonesia, I think, and India, and and it ended up being a, a you know kind of a nice 
a marker that people wanted to have, kind of a brand affiliation that they wanted to have. So that that was an interesting marketing angle. Cool. Yeah, and you're always so creative about that. So what what um what number would you give that? Uh, let's see. Marketing, I gave a three because three. you know th- there were there were definitely some things we had to think about and figure out. Um, Um, perfect. All right. So now let's, let's go to the other side, the, the more operational side to support a lot of these different go-to-market strategies. So let's start by looking at the admin premium in the bottom, right? Yeah. So talk, talk through what those are. Yeah. The- sorry, sorry, sorry. Context. Uh, the admin premium is whether you have to create a new corporate entity, taxation, currency differences, government regulation, protecting intellectual property, some countries, it's difficult to get money in and out of the country, things like that. So I rated this one a five, which I term as an absolute shit show. <laughs> it's tough. This is a hard one. Uh, we did end up forming an entity, very complex process to both form and maintain tax eight. We, we did take in uh, funds locally. So, it, you know, taxation was at play. Uh, in India, everything was manual, paper-based. So the record keeping and all of that was just a pain in the butt. It was not fun, um, but it was worth it. You know, so this one was definitely a five in that we had to put, we had to invest a lot into it, but we did get a great return by doing that. So I, I don't know if I would do that again. I think, you know, it's amazing how markets change over time, uh, you know, and I think what's happened lately with COVID and, um, you know, you don't necessarily need an entity now to hire people in different countries. So you can kind of do things a little bit differently today. I don't know that I would do that again, but uh, that's what we did at the time. And uh, luckily it, it paid off. We did get a good ROI out of that investment. Yeah. And in, in this category, government can just have a lot of different effects on things because of how they yes, run. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the, the next one at the bottom is organization premium. So this is whether you have to hire a new team there or you have existing resources that can help serve that market. Also differences in business culture and how business is done. Yeah, this one I, I gave a four and that was kind of a combination of a team needing to build the team and culture. Uh, culture is uh, really different. And you have to take the time to really figure it out because if you want to develop a team or, or, or build a team that's, that's excited about the mission, that's aligned with the company, you have to understand where they're coming from first so that you can communicate everything in a way that they can get excited about it. So for instance, in India, equity, to tell someone that you're going to give them equity in a company is, is like, they don't care. They don't want it. They're totally cash. So we changed our equity incentives into cash bonuses for India specifically. Uh, it was something they could understand a lot easier and something they frankly cared about. They didn't care about the equity. They're not sitting in a cafe in Silicon Valley dreaming about how much equity they got in the latest, heart of, the latest startup, right? It's, it's a different mentality. So being able to understand those cultural nuances and catering to that, I think was very, very important to us being successful with the team there. And then the other dynamic culturally that I worked really hard on was making sure that, um, and my country manager, Anurban, that I mentioned before, was really good at this. Um, but a lot of people in India have a difficult time with question like, questioning their boss or having a conversation with their boss. I was the boss, but I don't know everything about India. I'm relying on Anurban to tell me when I'm saying something that may not make sense for India, right? So being able to speak up to the boss and say, Troy, I I understand your idea. It might not be the best idea. I have an alternative idea that we might want to explore, right? Like just being able to say that culturally is very, very difficult. So um, that's something that I worked on really hard on the cultural side. Awesome. Uh, yeah, very, very good points. Um, and, and then finally, the, the last point is infrastructure premium. 
And so this will be a little different if it's a physical versus versus software product. Physical products, it may be something like supply chain. For a software product, it might be like tech stack. Some countries, you have to keep citizens' data in country and stand up a new tech stack. There's also things like you had spoke about payment processing. So yeah. um, let's talk about where you would rate this. Yeah, this one I gave a two. Uh, really, the main thing we had to do was, was data processing. Uh, data sovereignty was not an issue with India. It later started to become an issue, but at the time it wasn't really an issue. They didn't require that the data of Indian citizens was housed in India on a server. So we didn't have to deal with any of those issues. It was mainly payment processing that we had to overcome. And um, we ended up using uh, Adyen for our payment processing. And uh, once we got into the groove with the integrations with Adyen, it, it, it worked well. But as great as Adyen is, we did have to have an entity in India specifically to work with Adyen. So that was actually a requirement. They couldn't do what they do in most other countries in India. Interesting. Well, cool. By so, the way, um, sorry, I had to go to a blue too. Uh, <laughs> everything else was was yellow, but I couldn't find couldn't find <laughs> a yellow too. But no, yeah. <laughs> no, no worries. This is this is mm -hmm in action, right? To show the, yeah. the enhanced video experience. Um, exactly. So um, this is fantastic uh, information, and I know I would want to talk about this for an hour with you, but we would <laughs> love to get the perspective of some of our attendees, and so we'd love to. Uh, to see any questions you have, you can raise your hand and we can we can make sure to uh, to give you the floor to be able to ask questions. We another great way is just to go through the um, the Q and A and ask ask questions there. Uh, we can do that. So um, so feel free to jump in. Um, yeah, typing typing may be easiest for everyone, but uh, but yeah, we can go ahead. And in the meantime, while people are writing their question, I just want to mention one thing is that. When using this tool, it's important to be multiple people, right? Troy has his own experience around expansion, right? But it should really be a collaborative process between different functions and people from different, you know, parts of the yeah. business, right? So yeah. this is his biased view on the localization premium. I'm sure if there was a couple of other parties that was in some of these other business areas, it may have been adjusted a bit, right? So, so just just want to throw it out there. It's actually a collaborative process working with this tool. But I see uh, Davey want to say something, so I'm going to allow you to talk, uh, uh, Philip. So I'll uh, turn it on now. OK, thanks, class. Thanks, thanks Troy. Lots of great insights there. Um, I just had a quick question, because this is one we've run into, and I've spoken to quite a few people who have hit this barrier, which is, especially if you're starting with a small team compared to the head office. When you're working on a foreign expansion, how do you make sure that the goals and the targets for your expansion site are still aligned with what the head office has in mind? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to answer it maybe in a, in, in a way you might not expect. Uh, depending on the type of expansion that you're doing, but really the expansions that I've done at Weebly, at Evernote, mm-hmm. And, and a few others that I've kind of collaborated with people on. Uh, it's actually not a good idea to, ha to have those goals align with, with the headquarters. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, if you take the existing KPIs, the existing goals, say, from the bonsa, as we say in Korean, or the headquarters, and take that into India, or take that into Germany, or a new market where you're trying to find the product, like on, on the graph that they were showing, the center is product market fit that you have in your home market. It's not necessarily right away going to be the same in different countries, right? The, the act of going international has to include a certain period of time where you're acting as a startup, meaning that you're able to kind of pivot, try different things in a new market to get product market fit in that market. Once you get product market fit in a new market, then is when the headquarters aligns on, okay, and this is how we're going to measure Japan, you know, and, and, and roll up into our overall strategy. So when I do 
when, when I'm VP of international or acting as an executive that is the caretaker of the expansion, I make sure that I am absolutely clear with the CEO, the board, and everyone with that point so that I get adequate runway in each market to get market fit and then align the KPIs from there. So that, that's how I do it. Um, it's very difficult to do command and control from headquarters into new markets and find the right fit. That's usually how things fail is if you take everything from what works at headquarters and you kind of go into Thailand, like usually you don't figure it out. And if you don't have the freedom to explore and figure it out, that's where you can, can kind of fail in a new market. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Thank you. That's good food for thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's served me well in my career because it's all about creating the expectations. And, and what I do is I make sure that I create the expectation that this isn't going to happen overnight, but it will happen quickly. And here's my plan. Here's my rollout. And this is when I expect to get to, um, in, in certain markets, full visibility of that market and how we need to integrate it into our overall strategy. Yeah. And, and I, I think that that ties in actually well with one, one of the four commitments that we say companies need to make to be successful around this communication and clarity, but also a level of autonomy and trust that needs to be given to local yes. teams. So, yes. yes. And, and I've been, I think, overly lucky in my career, or maybe I was just good at what I chose to do, but I, I think I've been lucky in pairing up with CEOs and executive teams and boards that have understood that and given me the freedom to frankly do some pretty crazy things. When you think about the Dababala example that I gave you, like right. you bring that to the headquarters and people are like, what the F are you doing? Right? <laughs> but it worked beautifully, right? So, so having that freedom I think is, is key, but you as the executive need to set the stage to have that freedom. Well, knowing you, Troy, you've been very good at picking the right organization to work with. And then obviously <laughs> very, very clear communication as well. And that's why you're on uh, the call today uh, with us. Did you have any other questions, Philip, or should we go to the next person? If you don't mind, I'll follow up on that for just a moment, which would be thinking about timing for foreign expansions too then. Because obviously, if you want to be able to have assets in the runway to have that period to yeah. adapt your product market fit, your headquarter organization has to be able to support it. So when you're looking at new startups, um, so I, I'm coming from the perspective of a Japanese company expanding into the US. And when you're looking yeah. at a small startup with limited assets or limited capital compared to the market they're going into, yeah, you've got to think carefully about that timing. Yeah, um, that's true. That's true. And, and I think I've had the luxury of being at startups, yes, startups, but really well-funded startups that had runway and, and the resource to be able to give me that freedom. I would say when, when I approach expansion, going the other way from the, from the US outward, usually we're looking at smaller markets, right? Whereas you're coming into a big ass market. Although I think many people get U U.S. expansion a little bit wrong in thinking that the U.S. is a market. The U.S. is an amalgamation of many different markets, right? Like truly honing down to what your market is in the U.S. is important um, because the U.S. is very diverse, uh, you know, has, you know, each state is different, et cetera. So you got to kind of pick your battles and, and, and what, segment of America you're going to go after. But what I do is I put companies into buckets. In fact, I'm doing this for a company right now where I have an almost immediate availability of revenue and expansion bucket. A good example of this is the UK, Australia, and actually Israel, um, where there's minimal things we need to do to see revenue in those countries today. Right. So, so that's kind of like your initial shot in the arm on ROI. So, so, so you attack those immediately and get those done, get the infrastructure in place, and they start bearing fruits. Whereas if I'm going into Japan, there's a lot more localization on all those dimensions that needs to be done 
even though it's a great market, it's going to take some time. So I put them into two different buckets, immediately available, and then ones that are going to have a, a, a little bit longer time frame to get there, but just because there's more localization to do. So, and you could do the same thing in America and say, look, we're not going to hit, um, you know, the, uh, this particular segment yet, because it's going to take longer to develop. We're going to hit this segment in America only and focus in on them because that's where we're going to get our ROI first. Does that, I hope that makes sense for kind of what you're thinking of, but yeah, yeah. that's how I would think about it. Yeah, it does make good sense. And I think it ties quite strongly into the autonomy that you brought up previously. Yeah, you have to be able to convince your, your board of directors that that's worth the investment. Time. Right, right. Well, I think this is going to have to be the last question. Uh, we already went a full hour. So obviously, everyone, everyone want to listen to you for like two hours, Troy, because you have a lot of insights. <laughs> so really appreciate you coming to share your experience and the stories of expanding into India today. You put it very well in perspective by using the localization premium tool. So hopefully now people know and understand how to utilize it. Just want to make one point is that this is not just a pretty tool. We actually have a deep analysis framework behind it as well that we offer to clients when we work with them and help them go through the expansion efforts. Um, but with that, I just want to say thank you, Troy, and also thank you, uh, Aaron, of course, for steering the conversation with me. And just in conclusion, I want to just mention that there is going to be a survey coming out uh, to everyone after today's call. And then also, we already have the next session lined up with one of our good friends, also a global class book interviewee, uh, coming to share about Talibat's expansion into Oman. You know, the fastest growing last mile delivery startup coming out of Dubai, expanding all over the Middle East. And he has some very, very interesting stories to share as well about Oman expansion that not everybody really thinks about. And we don't often hear about Oman expansion, so it's going to be really, really unique. Um, so he's going to come here in two weeks. Uh, and this is going to be uh, at a slightly different time. It's going to be 8 a.m. Uh, PST at this time. So just as an FYI. And with that, obviously... If you want to learn more about Global Class, you can go in on globalclassbook.com. You can message Aaron and myself on email or on LinkedIn, or if you have our WhatsApps and text, you can always message, message us there as well. Uh, but for now, at least, I want to say thank you again, Troy, and thank you, Aaron, and thank you to the team, and thank you for everyone for joining today's call. Really appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you so much.